or not. All right, Josh, I think we are live. Welcome back to another episode of the Educated Home Buyer. This is our Christmas New Year's edition. This is where Josh and I are going to update you on what's happening in the economy, what's happening with mortgage rates, and more importantly, get to your mortgage and real estate related questions to help you become expert home buyers and sellers in the new year. Josh, welcome back to the show. Oh, it is great to be here, Jeb. We, uh, as you know, I started out the day very, very stressful. My one and only child was at the emergency room, my four-legged child. And um, the thought was what she may have was going to be really not good. So what she has is not good, but very fixable and curable. So I've had the emotional roller coaster of the day. So uh, if I'm a little blah, uh, I, I've used up all my uh, energy for the day. If you're more blah than normal, is that what you're saying? Yeah, me, the boring, quiet one, yes. All right. Well, you know, I was trying to go live on Instagram again. This doesn't seem to work. I don't know what's going on here. So if you were if you were anticipating another week of of the educated home buyer live on um on on Instagram, it might not happen this week because this is truly, you know, an issue uh until I get it resolved. But anyway, Josh, let's do this. Let's update everybody on what's happening with regards to inventory, what's happening in some of the charts. And then we'll get into some questions. So with that, if you guys have questions, start putting them in the in the chat now. We'll do our best to get to them as we dive into the episode. Uh, but with that, let's uh, let's let's start where we always do, Josh, and inventory. And once again, our our friends at Housing Wire and Altos Research have decided to take the week off, and so our charts look different once again. Uh, but with that, here we go. We're going to look at what's happening. Um, inventory this week dropped about 10,000 homes nationwide week over week. I think we're sitting somewhere around 522,000, um, versus where we were last week. Uh, we're going to take a look at what that actually means here in just a minute, but you can kind of see this chart. We've started to roll over. We've seen the peak this year, Orange County sitting at 1736, Huntington Beach at 151. Also, both of those areas have peaked. This shows us new listings data. So new listings this past week, we came in at 36,897 compared to last year where we were sitting at 31,794, more or less where we were back in 2021, Josh. Uh, the big difference is that rates are considerably different than they were back in 2021, but we can see that we're trending down. We're going to end the level in the year rather at the lowest levels with new listings, with inventory. And that's no surprise. That's essentially what happens year over year. Uh, this is a week over week breakdown of what actually took place. And we went from 538,667 homes nationwide to 528,601. This last, this same week last year, we went from 522 to 508. Our peak this year was at 569. Our low was actually last year at 240. Um, and to put things in context, back in 2015, we were sitting just over a million properties on the market uh, versus where we are today. Half of that, um, just over half of that, actually. Price drops um, starting at 36 percent uh, versus last year being at 40 percent for this time of year. Back in 2021, we we're at 25 percent. So even though 21 was a hot market, craziness happening in the market, just gangbusters out there, you still had a fourth of the properties out there having some sort of price reduction, some sort of um, you know, price cut. So price cuts aren't new to the market. Um, they're getting a little bit more publicity now just because rates are higher, demands a little bit lower, things are sitting a little bit longer. So they make the headlines. Whereas 21, there was no talk of price cuts, even though 25% of properties had them. The 10 year Josh continues to amaze, at least me, um, sitting at where do we end the day? Three, eight, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah. 380. And we have uh, our friends at Housing Wire. We're not going to say anything bad about them because they're awesome. They have very good data. They have good analysis. They loaned their friend Logan Modishami out to us to share lots of insights. Um, people are loving that video, getting a lot of, of views on this week's episode of the podcast. But this chart um, leaves a lot to be desired in terms of actually being able to read what it's telling you. So we'll we have another look at it here later in this. Live yeah, and, and I've only used this chart. Maybe we'll can this chart. I've only used it because we've used it in the past, but maybe we'll just continue with the better charts. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, which we post this episode every Friday on the actual Educated Home Buyer podcast. The charts are in the description of the video where you can go and check them out. So make sure if you have any questions about what we're talking about, you can check out 
the actual charts we're looking at. So we've gotten Case Shiller home price index once again, um, setting year over year numbers at 4.8%, month over month came in at 0.6. So October represented a new all time high for uh, for home prices. Josh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard for anyone to believe if you had told anyone in 2022 or, 20, or the beginning of 2022, and we're still at three and a quarter percent interest rate, that in less than 24 months, we're going to have a run up to 8% in interest rates. But at that time, the, the transactions closing at those interest rates will set an all time high in prices. None of us, including you and I here, would have believed that. So um, it's an amazing number. The The Case Shiller data is the, the gold standard for a reason. It's a repeat sales index. Um, and and with that, uh, it's, it's a really good look at it. Uh, this is just kind of the same data here showing you. It has tailed off, but you can see at the end of, of every year, it does uh, tail off in terms of appreciation. We don't really see a pickup in appreciation with that seasonality till uh, March, generally after uh, properties start going under contract people get serious about buying homes around the time of the super bowl so sometime in february they start closing in march and that gets us that seasonal uptick but um, especially in light of of what we saw in 2023 those negative bars there under that zero line uh the the all-time highs is a, a very big surprise this here i wanted to throw this one in jeb uh the headline always gets big attention that median price that median price moves around a, a lot more than any of those repeat sale indexes but when we look at them they generally kind of follow the same shape the repeat sales kind of smooths out some of those big ups and downs and that may be why the media prefers median because it gives them a better headline that it's a bigger number when it spikes it's a bigger number when it dips whereas the repeat sales is a much smoother line there when we're looking at it we also had fhfa um, fhfa uh, doesn't include jumbo loans doesn't include cash sales it only includes sales with loans that go to the government agencies so with that uh 6.3% year over year increase, a bigger increase. So why would that be Jeb? Because some of those cash sales, they're getting a nice little discount. And some of the jumbo sales that aren't picked up in here uh, are hurting a little bit more. The, the episode that will go live next Tuesday, we talked to Stephen Thomas. He breaks out that data of the luxury stuff a lot better. And the high price stuff is not performing as well as, as entry level. So 6.3 is a big number year over year. We talked about how shocking the Case Shiller number is. The one that blew my mind, Jeb, as I was looking through headlines today, and uh, someone at Seeking Alpha had spun this as this was a negative. It was a miss. The number was expected to be 6.6. .6. It only came in uh, at 6.3. So interesting information, but it just confirms what we've been seeing. Um, this one here, Jeb, I picked this up in looking at the FHFA data, and I thought this was, was interesting. Um, the 112% line is the growth in CPI going back to what, 1991? So prices have, have more than doubled in that time frame. So it's a very low inflation environment. Um, from that time frame. And we got a lot of that inflation here just in the last two years. But when we look at growth in nominal home prices, so the actual price you pay, home prices have tripled in that timeline, while inflation has only doubled. So up 112 versus 316. For some reason, they threw in growth in real home prices. So real home prices, they're adjusting for that inflation figure, the 112. So it's not super helpful in terms of that data. But it shows you, you know, when we talk about housing being in being an inflation hedge it does work out that way because we're going back all the way to the 70s now so the 70s to the mid 2000s mid mid 2020s we're going on 55 years here where home prices have increased at a higher rate than the level of inflation so that's not to say hey if you don't own you're bad you're dumb or if you don't own you have to run out and buy a house right now it just sort of reinforces what we always talk about, that when you are able to buy, it will help you in the long run financially because that trend is not going to reverse. It can moderate, but it's certainly not going to reverse uh, over the near term future. So this one, Jeb, another chart of the 10 year Treasury. I wanted to throw this. We just did a recorded our forecast for next year. And when we do that, we always want to look back at the last year. So this is a chart of the last year. That green line is where we are at right now. But if you look real similar to where we were uh, at the end of December last year, early part uh, of January. So 380 on the 10 year, the 10 year uh, when we got into March and April and we had all the banks failing, it got down to about 
328, 329 went as high as 5%. So pretty big range, but uh, a long and arduous journey. But we ended up here basically at the same place that we started the year. Mortgage-backed securities, you'll see here, um, these are prices. So you want the prices to go higher for those bonds because it pushes yields or interest rates lower. We're at 156 right now, a little bit better than where we started the year. Um, but if we look at really first quarter there or all the way through May, about where we're at right now and then had the the big sell off through uh you know through the third quarter of this year so with this what does that mean for actual interest rates optimal blues reporting 6.59 mortgage news daily 6.61 those are both pretty reasonable numbers fha six and a half and six percent i would i would uh hew more closely to the mortgage news daily info there if you're looking at an fha or a va it's going to be closer to six percent uh on those so with that that's uh that's all we got jeb it's a slow week here at the end of the year with not a whole lot of data not a whole lot of new information no and exactly why i'm sitting here in in the home office working from here versus in the office uh i tried to i know we got a couple people in here i did try to go live on instagram i i saw it live the problem was because of the way the headphones are set up right now it wanted to feed me both feeds listening to josh on this side and listening to the instagram thing in the same uh in the same headphones and i couldn't figure out how to cut it out without canning it so i just can the, the can the the live uh for this week so if, if if you need us we're here um so just go out and tell everyone that we're we're on youtube uh that said josh um you know you you mentioned this past week's episode logan matashami um housing wire a lot of you guys listen to him because we've told you to go listen to him provides a lot of good information out there but this last week we had him on the educated home buyer podcast really good episode the episode's doing really really well right now uh but go check it out on youtube it's also on spotify and apple if somebody's asking you what you think about the housing market hey you listen to a lot of housing refer them back to that episode i think it gives a lot of information a lot of good context breaks things down in a way people that can understand and apply it which is good. And then next week, we're talking to someone that kind of specializes more so in California, giving us a forecast there. Also, a really good episode. So just keep checking back to the Educated Home Buyer. A lot of really good forecasts coming, a lot of information that you can use to help yourself make better decisions in, in 2024. So, um, with that, Josh, we don't have a lot of questions here. Uh, so we're just going to, we're just going to, so we, we might go drink eggnog and sit by the fire. I think eggnog's done. Christmas is over. You can't drink eggnog anymore, right? You just go straight to champagne, start getting ready for uh, for New Year's? For New Year's, yes. You have to prime yourself for New Year's. Um, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea either, actually. Um, you know, I'm actually in the process, Josh, of taking a sleep apnea study at home. So I'm, I'm in my second night tonight. And, um, you know, we're going to see if I have sleep apnea. So I according like to my it. wife, I do. And I say no. So we're going to see who wins. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, let's dive into some questions, shall we? Um, Paul comes up with a question to start with. Says, "I suspect my wife and I will look to purchase around Christmas next year. When should we get pre-qualified? If I get pre-qualified, am I going to get relentless spam for housing?" So, I guess the better question is, Josh, is it ever too early to get pre-qualified? Um, and then the second part of the question is, you know. Is he going to get spammed? Yeah, no, my, my answer is no. It's never too early. Have a list of your questions. Um, that conversation can go any number of ways. I've got probably two, three listeners, viewers here, listeners of the podcast, viewers of the show um, that we didn't want to pull credit uh, because we're probably looking early to late spring. So when we get back here next week, first part uh, of January, first, second week, we're going to go ahead and pull the credit. But what we did do is went through all of their questions, went through what you would pretty much consider a pre-qualification I, 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 beyond that, because we did get income and asset docs confirmed. Yep, you are in the ballpark of what you're looking at. Um, and we'll go ahead and pull that and get ready. I had a conversation with a gentleman in Colorado here. Again, another, another viewer of the show that he's a year out. His lease isn't even up until the end of next year, but he did the right thing because he knew he's been working on his credit. He's been getting it up. He was telling me where it is, what he's doing, where he'll be by mid-year. And in that situation, we're going to talk again in June. Still not going to be ready in June, but we're going to do a check-in about six months ahead of time just to confirm 
What's the job situation look like? Is that income on his new job now usable? Uh, did he get the accounts paid off that he is on track to pay off by June? Where are the scores looking at that point in time? So it just allows you to get your ducks in a row and doing that full pre-approval or at least a pre-qualification lets you know, are you on track? You don't want to get a surprise at the 11th hour when there's no time to work on anything, whether that's saving some additional money, uh, getting your credit uh, scores improved, debts paid down. So never is is it too early to have that conversation? And if you reach out to someone and you tell them you're six to 12 months away and they don't want to talk to you, it's a pretty good sign that it's not someone that you want to work with because they should be willing to build a relationship and start with you at any point in time. I actually like the second part of this question, Jeb, because it's not something that we, we talk about a lot here on the show. So if you get pre-qualified, unless you do a hard credit pull, you're not going to have to, to deal with that. And there are some ways around this. What happens, and I actually was in um, Matt Graham from MBS Live, in his service, MBS Live, there's a forum there that a lot of mortgage professionals talk about. Guy had one of his clients that he pulled credit on yesterday. Before 8 a.m. this morning, his time, he had had 40 calls from trigger leads. So wow. you have to have a valid phone number tied to your credit file, but that's really the only way that anyone's going to know you've been pre-qualified. If you have a full hard credit pull, it gets marked as a mortgage credit pull. So in addition to the credit bureaus charging us three times what they charged 24 months ago for a credit report, now they sell 40 to 50 times for two, three dollars a pop. The fact that you had a mortgage inquiry under the guise of saying this is helping you become aware of all of the options when really what it's doing is it's feeding every bottom feeder call center operation on the planet that doesn't have any refis to do that now they think they can switch over and do purchases and chase after you. My favorite one, Jeb, is the first thing out of their mouth every time when you tell them, oh, I've already been pre-approved, I'm good. They'll say, oh, we can get you a much better rate. You haven't told them what the rate is. You haven't told them what your qualifications are, but they're always sure to tell you they can get you a better rate. Hey, you know, it's sales, man. They got to tell you. They, they got to make you believe. But with that, um, Jeb, the, the thing you can do to avoid that, if you know you're going to be doing a pre-approval, do the opt-out pre-screen. So go online. It's literally optoutprescreen.com. So you're opting out of all pre-screened credit offers, which those trigger leads are a pre-screened credit offer. So that's uh, one of those things. Put yourself on the do not call list also with all your phone numbers. There you go. Good stuff. All right. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, Don Trish Chapman went to basically my entire life at school with him. Um, he's asking how I got such great hair. Dude, it's as good as it always was. That's the, that, the, the thing is you can't see it thinning or the grays on camera, which is perfect, but it is. It's both thinning and gray. It's great. It's that Kinston water. That's what kept it strong, man. Um, let's see here. We've got Daniel Hernandez ask, well, we got a couple questions here. I'm going to click on this one real quick, just cause, uh, it's where my cursor went. Someone commented on Lance Lambert's post today in order to get, um, mortgage news daily's rate. You have to give 25% down and have above a 790. Is that true? So Josh, when you see the rates out there online, is it, for the buyer that's putting like some large amount down and having absolutely perfect credit, or I, 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 I typically think that you can get a better rate than what's quoted out there most of the time, that that's not the necess the, the best rate that's, that's offered in the market. So which well, is right. Here's the funny thing, Jeb. I just realized that we still have our slides up and we're still on the mortgage oh, yes. news daily slides. So yes, it's actually are. perfect. Leave it for now and then we'll take yeah. it down. I forgot. But yes. If you look on there, they, they always disclose, every website disclose what are the assumptions there that we're making on this in terms of credit score, loan to value, all of that. But Jeb, you're absolutely correct. We talk about it here every week. Some of the 790 credit score putting 25% down, I'm going to get them better than 6.596 that Optimal Blue is reporting, better than 6.61. So I don't look at that and go, hey, that's a, a liar rate there. That's a pretty good indication of someone with a, a, a five to ten percent down payment and a seven forty plus credit score is going to get. If you go above that, you're going to get even better. So to me, I don't think those are teaser things at all. Most likely, whoever that was that was commenting went to a cross country bank or one of these big uh, retail lenders that has awful rates, and they were saying to their loan officer, "Hey, Mortgage News Daily says I can get this," and their loan officer said, "Well, only if you have." 800 credit score and 50% down 
And since you're doing 3% down with a 700 credit score, we can't get you that. Um, those numbers are, are not aggressive. It is correct that they are not tailored to your specific situation, but at the same time, those aren't absurd numbers that either one of them put up there. All right, good stuff. Uh, uh, Lan, Lande Verde Jr. Lande Verde Jr. I don't know. I it might my, my maybe it's Jr. Off. Maybe it's not even Jr. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, maybe it's Jr. Lavande Verde. Uh, lower rates, higher prices? Question mark. Still means unaffordable. Unfortunately, shall we expect more laws banning single family homes from being sold to investors? and Airbnb and the like. So I don't know that there are any laws at the moment banning um, from, you know, investors buying single family homes. Now, sometimes there's a a restriction on the time period, like, you know, 90 days has to be sold for to to, uh, somebody that's going to occupy the home first. And after 90 days, then it can be sold to an investor. But I'm, I'm not aware of anything that's completely banning investors from purchasing homes. Um, But with that, you are right. Lower rates and and price stability, uh, more so than say higher prices, equals unaffordability for for the near future, at least in my opinion. Uh, but Josh, what are your thoughts on the uh, the second part of that? Well, you uh, saw the wonderful article a few weeks ago where some moron was saying 44% of homes were being sold to institutional investors. And as a result, our friends in Washington, D.C. have introduced some legislation uh, to make it illegal to buy for a corporation to buy more than 100. Not not illegal for them to buy, but uh, eliminating tax deductions and benefits, things of, of that sort. So will there always be efforts? Yeah, but there are constitutional protections for people for for businesses so it would be interesting to see where those go but you're 100 correct there's always restrictions my place in the desert we used to be able to do weekly rentals on vrbo and now we're only able to do monthly rentals much harder to rent a place on a monthly basis than to rent it to someone a week most people can't do a vacation for a month and then when they see the price of a nice vacation rental for a month most people choke um, but they probably also never looked at staying at a nice hotel for a month so from that perspective i definitely think we will continue to see a push for limitations and you know to me we talk about this on the show all the time that i don't love the idea of government uh, solutions to problems but totally understand that if we have areas where there are investors buying up single families for short or long-term rentals and we have a problem with people that live in those communities not being able to buy needs to be a balance needs to be something reasonable there Agreed. 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 Um, let's see. Shaban says, my interest rate is currently six and an eighth and was wondering if I should refinance or wait as interest rates uh, can go down more. So I'm thinking if you're at six and an eighth, there's very high likelihood that there's not an opportunity for you to refinance unless you have an FHA loan and um, or a VA loan and you can do some sort of streamline and you know, and you can get a rate somewhere in the mid 5% range. I mean, that's really the only thought that I have on that um, at the moment. Uh, Now, with that, I think there will be opportunities in the future to refinance under six and an eighth percent, depending on what type of loan you have. But the question is, how long? How long is it going to take? How much equity are you going to need? All of those things, which we don't really have that information. So, um, you know, Josh's rule is to take your loan amount um, you know, divide 125, 125,000 into your loan amount. Um, and that will tell you how much you need to save in order for it to make sense. Um, so say for example, your loan amount is $500,000. If you divide 125 into that, you need to save about half a percent in order for that, that number to make sense, um, with regards to refinancing. But the one thing we don't never talk about is the cost involved, right? The number makes sense, for you to do it. So a half a percent, but if somebody's charging you some crazy amount to refinance, then that, then that might, that half a percent might not make sense, right? You've got to factor in how much it's going to cost. How long are you going to keep that loan? What's the cost, you know, um, benefit there? What's that, what's that actually look like over a period of time? How much are you going to ta- cost you to, to, to repay that? Uh, so you got to factor all that stuff in. And that's why it's important to work with a professional. Talk to somebody like Josh, who can walk you through that process and help you understand it. 
Um, Josh, and Jeb, just to kind of yeah. triple triple down on what you said there, um, the big call center operations, inexperienced loan officers, when they're talking to someone about refinancing, it's always about rate and, and monthly payment savings. We can get this rate, and we can save you this much per month. But remember, not only is there a cost to the loan, which oftentimes to get that low rate, they're talking about points. You have your regular closing costs, your points to get the rate, but there's a cost in the time that you're giving up. If you took out that loan two and a half years ago, that's 30 months of payments that you're giving up. So when we're doing the analysis, not only do we wanna look at what rate and payment can we get you, are we adding anything to your loan amount? And are we adding any months in terms of term? Because the reality is our number one goal and objective here is to become homeowners and eventually become mortgage free 20, 30 years down the line so we can be independent in retirement. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, a really quick one here. This is pretty easy to answer. Dan, the man uh, says, have you seen any scenarios where age restricted communities are available to anyone? I have not personally. Um, I have seen 55 and older communities allow people that are not 55 and older to own properties in those communities, but not occupy them, not live in them. They could, could do so as rentals and that sort of thing. But I've never seen a community that says, Hey, we have these, you know, certain CCNR restrictions in place, but yet we're going to bypass them and allow anyone to occupy. I mean, that, that takes a whole rewrite of, of the bylaws of the community, um, which in and of itself is, is not easy to do. So, um, I'm sure there are people that have done it, but I've never seen it. I'll, I'll give you an example, Jeb. My grandma lives in Hayden, Idaho in Leisure Park and Leisure Park used to be 55 and over and they were having problems uh, with keeping home values up by limiting to 55 and over because it, it's a younger area. There's plenty of retirees that go to North Idaho, but younger area, they were just having a hard time. So they dropped that number to 40 and no children. So you couldn't be 42 with three you know, teenage kids and move in there, but they can and do change. Like you said, it's hard to do, but I've never heard or seen of one just eliminating restrictions entirely. There you go. Uh, another kind of easy one here. Vince says, looking to list my house. When is the most ideal time to list now or early spring? So now would not be the ideal time um, if we're talking today, right? It's the 27th of, of December. Uh, I would say that the inventory, the market demand, all of those things typically start to pick up, you know, as you and toward the end of January into the first week of February, that's when the market starts to turn. Now, last year, we never really saw that pick up in inventory just because it was kind of a weird year with people having locked in low rates and interest rates were higher and that sort of thing could be similar this year. Uh, so I would say be ready, like get the pictures done, be ready to list your home early February uh, with the idea that you know, by March, you probably have a buyer if you're priced right, depending on your market. Um, and it might take a little bit longer just because your house doesn't sell in a day or a week doesn't mean it's overpriced. Um, it's, you know, you got to allow some time and some of these, especially coming out of the holiday season for things to just kind of pick back up a little bit. But I think, you know, rates moving lower will help with buyer demand. Um, but price it right, price it right from the start. Don't get crazy with the number. I do still think we're in a market where if you're priced right, you're going to do well. If you're under the median for your market, I think you have a better opportunity than if your home is priced above the median in that market uh, just because of, of where affordability is. Uh, so, you know, take that all into account. Talk to a professional if you need one, you know, real estate and or mortgage like we were discussing earlier. There's a link in the description that'll get you to somebody that uh, Josh and I both know, like and trust. So um use that use that to your advantage there's no cost to doing it um josh we got a question here around fha asking for first-time home buyers how should i view the fha loan wouldn't that make the monthly payments higher than putting the normal 20 percent down well i will take exception to the idea of a normal 20 percent down um the average down payment right now is about 14, 15%. And we've gone through the charts before that that's higher than normal um, due to high rates, high prices. That's a different type of buyer buying right now. And they generally are putting bigger down payments. Uh, in a normal market, that's seven to 8% down. So 20% avoids mortgage insurance. It's a smaller loan. So are those things beneficial? Do they make a lower monthly payment? Yes, they absolutely do. 
but the time it takes to save up 20% down will also push out the time before you can buy. So the question comes down to, do you have 20% down and you're looking at three and a half percent down versus 20% down? And then that's there then a false dichotomy because it's not the only options that we have. You have a 3% down conventional, 5%, 10%. We need to look at all of those options and compare them side by side. We had the chart there from Optimal Blue, Mortgage News Daily. You're at least a half percent, if not three quarters of a percent lower with FHA than you are with conventional. Now, assuming we're comparing a 20% down to a three and a half percent down, you're gonna have mortgage insurance on that three and a half, 0.55%. So it, it puts them at about parity in terms of what you're paying for the money. But again, the FHA has a bigger loan. The biggest issue with FHA is they also charge an upfront mortgage insurance premium. You put three and a half percent down, they add 1.75% finance back on top of that. You can pay it out of pocket, no one does. Um, so from that perspective, what you really need, numbers never lie, we pencil it all out, we do a side-by-side -side comparison and figure out which one is right for you. Every time a question like this comes up, other people start chiming in in the comments, well, this, do this, do that, do this. No one can tell you from just answering the comments. You have to look at the entire situation, know what you have available to you, what timeline you're looking at, what your credit score looks like. All of these things are going to come into play. The FHA loan is neither the greatest thing ever nor evil to be avoided. We do a lot of them. It's a very good loan program, but it is not the right option for everyone. All right. Good stuff. Hearing it from the horse's mouth. There you go. Call me um, a Yes, exactly. Exactly what I called you. Uh, let's see here. Willing, one of our regulars here says brought or there's a brand new home built being built estimated to be completed on January 25th for only 5,000 more than I paid for my 1983 home. My stomach hurts and I feel like I could throw up. Did I make a grave mistake? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's hard to say without knowing what what's out there. But the one thing you need to factor in with new construction, a lot of these things, you know, don't, they don't have yards. There's no grass. There's no landscaping. There's no shutters on the windows, no window treatments. No, you know, everything is builder, basic builder grade quality. Nothing is upgraded in these properties. So in order to, you know, do some of these things, you're going to end up spending more money. So that new construction property is likely going to end up costing more than just $5,000 versus your home. But at the same time, Location of that property, square footage of that property compared to yours, a more established neighborhood. What school district? Like, does it have Melarus? Like, all of these different things that you need to factor in than just more looking at the number and saying, okay, yeah, it's new construction, so there's there's an advantage there, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a better property or a you know a better home in general. So take all of those things into consideration. Um, but you know, here's the thing: I would I tell everybody once you buy your home, move on. Stop looking at Zillow every day. You don't need to look at Zillow every day unless you're planning on moving. Just live your life. Make your mortgage payment and then look back in five, 10 years and be happy that you did. But what if you find out your $1.4 million house is actually worth $14 million per Ooh. Zillow the week after you, you buy it? You know, that's, yeah, I'd be pissed. I'd be, I'd be so mad. I, I mean, because my property taxes would go up considerably. Can you imagine? Ugh. We, uh, we, we joke, but Jeb, we've talked about, you guys ask all the time, how accurate is this estimate? There was a house here in Huntington Beach that sold for $1.4 million. The agent fat fingered into the computer at $14 million. And the day later, the estimate went up to $14 million, actually $15,000 more than it sold for because it's gone up in the last couple of days. Tell you all the time not to pay attention to Zillow. Um, I've got so many exam examples, these examples. We're just adding a Z to everything because of the Zestimate. Uh, as examples of the Zestimate gone zong. Um, so don't pay attention to it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, let's see. Um, what do we got, Josh? When will? Well, go ahead. There's there's some really good ones here. So let's let's go back to Vince and then Sherelle has a really good one. Yeah. So Vince says, would you do a loan recast at the same time you refinance or do a loan cast bef recast before the refi? Asking because rates are supposed to improve over the course of 2024. Um, 
you would, I don't think you would do it before because there's a cost in time, effort, and energy. And generally the lender will charge you two to three to $500 to prepare and record the modification documents. In essence, what you're talking about is a cash in refinance. If you want to pay it down a hundred thousand dollars, don't do a hundred thousand and then recast that loan. That's going to be replaced with the new refinance. You just go and refinance and say, Hey, I've got a hundred thousand dollars here. I don't need to refinance my $300,000 loan balance. I need to refinance and that's $200,000. So it's, it's not technically called a cash in refinance, but that's what it is. Um, you're going to bring cash in at closing to get to the new loan amount. I would wait and just do it all through closing faster, simpler, easier, cheaper all the way around. There you go. Good stuff. Um, Jeremy says that I nailed the interest rate call, uh, says our custom build is finishing in a month or so. Four months ago, I asked if you thought rates would end up in the 6% range in January. You said yes. Looks like you nailed your prediction. Mr. 6%. I'm Mr. 6% now, Josh. Jeb was so confident of his prediction. My wife. He shaved, he shaved his beard six weeks in yeah. advance of the rates getting there. My wife's always said I was a, I'm a three out of 10. I'm a six out of 10, Josh. Look Perfect. at that. I am I am so much higher than she said she's giving me credit for. Uh, no, but in all seriousness, congrats. Um, I think rates will continue lower. Um, sometimes we get them wrong. Sometimes we get them right. You know, it's 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 one of those things. You just got to stand by whatever you, you know, you can't can't let the, the you know, the, yeah, don't let the YouTubers bring you down just because you get it wrong. So, um, Jeb, Jeb, no, 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 no. Take no. that one down. We're going to answer right. that. But you, you've you now set the bar. You are the predictor. You are the prognosticator. Oh, you are the Nostradamus of interest rates. Yes. Sherelle starts with when will the interest rates go down? When is the best time to refinance? And they have a little bit of time to wait because they're on a three to three, two, one buy down. Mm. So with that, they're probably going to be going to a higher interest rate at the time that they do that refinance. Um, but not really because it's being subsidized each month with that balance there. So start with uh, your thoughts on when interest rates go down from here. They've already dropped a percent and a half over the last six mm. weeks. When do they go down further from here? I think you... Um... I think February, February, you see the data from January, um, which I think is the first month where you're going to see a meaningful move in inflation data, because I don't think you're going to see it when January reports December data. Um, I think it's going to be, we're going to pretty much come in locations. Employment numbers are probably going to be a little bit higher coming out of the holiday season because of part-time hiring. Just a lot, some things that are going to support a strong economy to, to some degree, uh, even though that stuff's factored in. Uh, so I think February is probably the first month where you see a little bit of change in month over month numbers, inflation numbers, maybe a little bit of change in employment numbers, which in turn could give us a better idea of whether a Fed rate cut is actually going to happen in March. So that means, you know, if that's the case and the data supports it, then you might see a move at that time. Um, Hard to say. I, I think right now we're just going to kind of in this this holding pattern. I think I th believe you could see rates maybe edge down a little bit from here, but probably trade in that in a range from six and a quarter to six point seven five for a couple of weeks. I, I I don't know. There's not really a lot of meaningful stuff coming out, you know that that I expect big numbers, big changes on. What are, what are your thoughts on that? So um, you, when we were recording today, you pointed out correctly that in terms of PCE, the number for December that's going to fall off when we get the January data is a zero. So there's no, there's no potential for improvement unless we saw a negative number uh, month over month, which is unlikely. So we're going to see flat PCE numbers, which won't make rates worse, but it's also not going to give us some of that tailwind that we need to move rates lower. So over the two, three months, after that, we're likely to see both CPI and PCE trend lower in a meaningful way. And if we get that, rates will move lower. But when we say we just went a percent and a half lower over the last six weeks, and we've gone pretty much straight line down, we have not had a consolidation, we haven't had a retracement, we haven't given any of that back. It would not surprise me if in the first four to six weeks of the year, we give a little bit of it back. I'm not saying we will, but it wouldn't surprise me if we did. But as we get March, April, May, we're likely to have confirmation that the economy is slowing, maybe a recession, maybe not, but slowing from where it is. We get some weak employment figures. 
we start seeing the the truth of the matter that uh, inflation is is back really near that two percent trend that uh, the Fed wants to see, and they're likely to cut in March. You will see rates start dipping. So when will interest rates go down? I don't think we're going to see it in the first quarter. I don't think they're going to get worse in the first quarter, but I don't think they're going down from here in a meaningful way in the first quarter. So if I were you, Sherelle, I would watch it closely. And if, if I was wrong and rates started trending up, it may be the right time to, to pull the trigger. Um, you know, the, the follow-up question she had is we're worried we won't be able to refinance and get a higher rate in year three. I wouldn't wait until year three because again, in looking at how that three, two, one buy down works, that is almost three points worth of buy down. It goes into an account and it subsidizes your payment. You don't ever really have that lower interest rate. They're using those funds to give you the payment of that lower interest rate. Your actual note rate for the last 27 years is higher. So what we're looking at is what is my note rate uh, after the, the third adjustment? And what does that compare to where the current market is? And any money that is in that buy down account, you can do a couple of things with it. You can either use that balance to buy the loan down to a smaller amount. So if you owe $300,000 and there's 10,000 in that account, you refinance for 290. Or you can say, I got $10,000. I have two and a half points to cover all of my closing costs and buy that rate down even further. So it is very important that you're working with a loan officer that can walk through this, do that side-by-side -side comparison, give you the analysis you need to make the right decision for your family. It's always going to be a tough call in the first one to two years because it's likely since you're 3% below where you're going to be on that note rate, you're likely going to be giving uh, go, giving something up and going to a higher payment, but it is still probably the right move. My gut is it's going to be somewhere in Q2, Q3 is going to be the right time for you to pull the trigger. All right. And I'm going to follow up with another question um, from Sherelle asking, is it bad to refinance multiple times? And the answer could be either way. It could be yes and it could be no. The answer is yes, it's bad to refinance if every single time you refinance, you build the cost to refinance into your loan. So your loan balance goes up every time. You start over at a 30-year fix every single time you refinance. That's that's bad. You buy it, you ping down points, whatever the reason is, That's that's not good. But if if every time you refinance, you can get the cost covered as part of, of of the rate that you take, and you know if you've knocked two three years off your loan, you refinance back at whatever the term is you have right at that time. You know you redo a twenty seven or twenty eight or whatever the number is. Then it's not. I mean, I would keep refinancing every opportunity you get as long as it makes sense. You know that cost benefit you know ratio, if you will, right? So if it's going to cost you. $2,500 to refinance and you're saving, you know, for easy math, $200 a month. Well, you know, just over two years, you're going to repay that cost to refinance. You got to decide if you're going to be in that property forever, then that makes sense. If you're thinking, Hey, in six months, I'm probably going to sell this thing. Then it probably doesn't make sense. So start weighing those things when you talk and make sure again, working with a pro, a pro will guide you. They'll ask you these questions. They'll trigger certain things in your head that that will make you or help you in making the right decision uh, but with that josh i've refinanced three or four times um you know before you even made I your had. first payment you've refinanced three or four times <laughs> this time actually before i made my first payment i refinanced <laughs> it's not closed yet but it is it's happening mm -hmm. oh that's crazy um all right <laughs> <coughs> excuse me i clicked on this one a moment ago i had the flu guys i don't know if i told you so last thursday Last Thursday? Yeah, last Thursday. Uh, son was sick with the flu. Uh, Friday, or took him to the, the doctor, said, hey, he's got flu. Great. He came home. Everybody else got sick. And I only had it for about a day and a half where I, I didn't feel well. But, dude, the cough just lingers. It's It's been over a week now. And um, still not still not good. So, anyway. All right. Alma says, does it bring value to a community or hurt it with a new restaurant, gas station, hotel, less than five or six blocks away? I would say it depends. Um, some areas that could be a benefit. Other areas, it could be um, less of a benefit, right? So I'm trying to give you an example. Um, say, for example, like Inglewood, California, right? It's, uh, it's, it's where you now have SoFi Stadium. You have the new Clippers Arena coming in. Um, all of that new building, there's houses within 
blocks of some of, of, of the new construction that's gone there. The values, because of all of that new construction, what's gone in, have caused those values to more than double um, from when this, this original plan was announced. So in that case, it's helped property values. But at the same time, it could be an eyesore for some people. Some market's not always gonna gonna hit the same way. Um, you know, when things are done tastefully, they're nicer restaurants, that sort of thing, that helps out. You know, people like here in Southern California try to fight Walmarts, right? If a Walmart's coming to the area, it's like, oh my God, the devil's here. Like, let's keep the Walmart away because it brings in, you know, bad people. Okay. The same people in North Carolina are wishing for the Walmart to come in down the street, right? It's just a matter of, of where you are and, and kind of what people believe about it. Um, so it's, it's hard to say without knowing for sure, but I would say when it's done tastefully done in, in a, a nice way, um, it usually helps the community and, and adds value to it. Uh, you just don't want them on every corner. Josh, what are your thoughts? The funny thing is the gas station uh, always reminds me of an interesting thing. And I forget the distance. I want to say it's a, uh, like 400 yards, 500 yards. FHA will not do a loan yeah. within like three, 400 yards yep. of a gas station. Um, actually had one that we had one of our lenders. It was marked on the appraisal. The underwriter didn't catch it. I didn't know. And it, because it wasn't a gas station. It was a gas storage tank uh, in, in Carson and closed the loan. And FHA said, hey, we're not insuring that. You're too close to it. So um everything you said, but also if, uh, if it's a brand new gas station that wasn't there before and it's close to your house and gas storage tanks, it could eliminate FHA financing for future buyers. Good stuff. Some things to take into consideration there. Um, yeah, but I've been triggered, mildly triggered. Um, Vince follows up with a follow-up, a little more info on the loan recast and refi. Loan is through third federal, loan recast is free, and the refi is free until 2027. So again, on that recast, we said two, three, four, five hundred bucks. Um, so absolutely. Are there lenders, especially banks like that, that will eat that cost? 100%. So if you want to do it, it makes you feel better, gets that payment lower. You would rather than having the money in the bank, have that lower payment, do that anytime you want. It doesn't matter in your situation. But what we're going to talk about is this last part. Loan recast is free and refi is free. This is the biggest bullshit marketing ploy that call center lenders, banks, other people do. I will give you a giant news flash. You are not getting a free loan. It's a zero point loan. They're going to build it in there. They are making money on that loan. So say, cool, what does my free loan cost? And then talk to a broker, talk to an independent mortgage banker and say, is this good terms? Can we beat those terms? Because I can guarantee you it's going to be very similar, if not even worse than what you can get on a free loan from a, another lender. There's no one out there that says, hey, we want purchase business so bad that six months, eight months, 24 months down the line, we're going to eat this for free. Rocket puts it on their commercials. They also put on there that we're going to pay a percent of your mortgage for the first year. How can they afford to do that? Because their rates are awful. So, you know, these marketing ideas of saying, hey, we have these big margins. How can we give you the margin back and tell you it's something better? Make sure you're shopping around. Don't ever go back to a lender and just take their word for it. That, hey, I got to go back to my lender because they're giving me a free loan. Make sure their free loan is cheaper or at least as cheap than what you can get elsewhere. All right. Good stuff. Mike is asking the question, if I'm living in L.A., I want to buy a property in Miami, uh, a second home. Would the rate be higher? I am not going to live in Miami. So Mike, let me give you some advice. I owned a property in Miami when I lived in Southern California. There is no world in which you need to own a property in Miami for what it costs to get back and forth to Miami, have a car in Miami and or rent a car every time you go. Unless you just plan on being there for extended periods of time, it just you can stay in the best hotels for what it costs to, to have to spend a, a week in Miami, you can go there once a month and stay in the hotel and have a hell of an experience and be right where you want to be and never have to worry about it. Uh, but that's just me, right? But Josh, with that, um, second homes, are rates typically higher? 
So second homes used to be the greatest deal or bargain in the world that you had to put at least 10% down under Fannie Freddie guidelines, but you would get the same rate as an owner occupied loan. Uh, the risk didn't change. There's no additional uh, worry of loss on their part, but um, a certain administration in Washington, D.C. and their appointees to the FHFA said, hey, we need to make some more money to subsidize a few other things. So now they are treated exactly the same as a an investment property. So it used to be people would lie. They would be buying an investment property. They would, nope, it's going to be my second home. Um, we don't have that anymore because the terms are exactly the same. The, L, the loan level price adjustments, the hits to the interest rate are going to be identical. So anything less than 25% down is brutal. When you get to 30, 35% down, it gets a little bit better. So in this instance, you will want to check with independent banks that make portfolio loans, uh, credit unions that make portfolio loans because they are few and far between a broker who has access to portfolio loans because there are options out there that price them not as good as what we used to have, but definitely better than an investment property. But either way, you're going to pay anywhere from a little to a lot more than an owner occupied loan. All right, there you go. Um, question here for you, Josh. Uh, somebody wants to know if you can do business in the state of Washington. Absolutely. So I am personally licensed in Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Utah, <laughs> Texas, Arizona. So most of the West Coast, our company is licensed in 18 states and our broker owner of United American that we have the Bywise uh, mortgage under the umbrella of United American is approved in about 21, 22 states where I would assist. He would be your actual loan officer. You get the same great rate uh, terms and service and still deal with me uh, directly in, in any of those states as well. Well, there you go. Um, let's see what we got here. So, you know, it's it's amazing. So I'm at home, right? So I'm just using a webcam. Uh, Josh, by the way, I, I forget how crystal clear our cameras are at the office versus the webcam. Yeah. So I'm looking at you going, man, that thing is clear versus this. But it's crazy how much the screen light impacts my side here. So like I, I've got another tab opened here. This tab is set. I, I set everything to dark. So this tab is set to dark. You can see the light. I switch to this one. That's no longer the dark it's like a regular tat and dude the light that comes off that's crazy but anyway just side note i just in case anybody wondered out there how the world of you know i just switch back light drops anyway that's my uh amazement for this evening um josh we've kind of gone through a lot of the questions here sure. this is actually the refi night in terms of questions sherelle had a follow-up on there if the rates do drop <laughs> What are some other options to get a lower mortgage? What are points? Um, a point, my definition is 1% of the loan amount, but you don't have to pay a full point. You can pay a half point, three quarters of a point, 0.749 points. And what that is, it's a yield adjuster. A lender on any given day wants a yield for your loan. So if they say the par rate is 5% and you want 4.75%, in general, you will pay a point, 1% up front. And they say, we're going to make a little less on every one of the payments you make, but we get a little bonus there at closing in that one point. So you pay points to buy the rate down to a lower level and have a lower monthly payment. You get points in the form of a lender credit to cover closing costs if you're willing to take a higher than that par or market interest rate. So when it comes time for you to refinance, if you're in one of those states, you can reach out to Josh and he can go through all this stuff with you. But we can connect you wherever you're at in any of the 50 states with someone who will show you all of the options that we talked about. Are we adding the costs back into the loan? Are we going back to a 30 year term? Are we paying points? Are we not paying points? All of that comes into play. So even though it's very simple, I have this loan, I want a lower interest rate loan. What are my options? There are a number of decisions to be made. And it's important that you're working with someone that knows how to present all of those to you so that you can make the best informed decision for you and your family. There you go. Good stuff. Uh, so, you know, we're 53 minutes into this. If you haven't done so already, if you could hit the thumbs up, it helps the YouTube algorithm push it out to more people like you. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not so done so already. Uh, the Educated Home Buyer Podcast. You guys might be familiar with it. Maybe you have or, or not. Uh, we're on Spotify. We're on Apple. It's a podcast to help you understand all aspects of, of real estate in detail and mortgage in detail, financing. We go over everything. 
Um, the last couple of weeks, we've talked to experts across the United States uh, that give you forecasts on where they believe housing is going to go. So be sure and go over and check it out. If you like the content, subscribe, tell a friend. That's how things spread, and it will greatly help us. Um, a lot of you guys follow Zuber, uh, Michael Zuber, One Rental at a Time here on YouTube, has another great channel. Um, I actually was on his show today. The episode will go live tomorrow, but it's talking about thoughts for 2024, where we see the market going, predictions, if you will. Um, so, you know, if you like Michael, you want to hear thoughts on that, go check out that episode. It'll drop tomorrow. But Josh, um, what, what is going on? Oh, you, okay. Never mind. Um, what are one, two, three, uh, post everywhere? Yeah, exactly. What are, uh, your biggest takeaways from the episodes that we've done with the experts? Were there any surprises in there? I guess is a better question. Um, I don't believe so. Um, they surprised me individually and in what I know of them and what they were willing to share with us, uh, on a podcast, but, um, not really, you know, because we follow them, we read them all day, every day, you get to know their personalities, you get to know their beliefs, you get to know the direction that they're going. Um, the biggest surprise would have been Matt Graham saying that we could see interest rates with a five handle by the end of the year. And we're not far from it. I've locked a couple in the low sixes, six and a quarter, 6.375 and government loan. That's not even that big of a deal. A five nine nine, not difficult at all. And that's why a lot of the people that are at seven seven and a half percent on FHA VA loans, they're absolutely available uh, to benefit from from refinances right now. So even though it was a little bit of an aggressive call, and he wasn't calling it, he was calling it out as a possibility. Um, just kind of opens up your eyes to what is possible going forward. So. Um, it was surprising that each and every one of them has a pretty solid expectation of rates going down next year. They're all, they look at different things. So different data is sort of leading them to that conclusion, different expectations of what's going to happen in the economy next year. But it dovetails with, with a lot of the folks uh, that we're reading. There's only so much data out there. We say follow the data. It's not like there's another data set out there that you go, oh, I'd never considered that. They're all looking at the same stuff. Um, and I'm more than open to having a guest on who looks at that same data and interprets it differently, but no one out there has a different data set that's telling you anything different. The, the magical VRBO data set that was showing that everyone was losing money in Phoenix happened to be false numbers. And that's generally what we see when someone comes up with some new angle or new piece of data that, uh, that is telling us us different. So the surprise would have been Matt's call, but also how looking at Similar data from different angles leads all of them to similar conclusions. No. And if you're no idea what Josh is talking about, go over and check out those episodes. They're all about 30 minutes or so. You can put them on two speed to be done in 15 minutes, but you'll be a lot wiser uh, at the end of, of, of listening to that. And, um, and, and I think big, better decisions. Um, Josh, there's Vince come back on and, and said he didn't mean to irritate you. No, uh, no, it was actually, it was good. It was a public service announcement because that is a, a line that a lot of these call centers throw out there. So it may be, they may be doing a great free loan for you. Like Jeb is able to take a benefit of something that 99% that of borrowers couldn't. He's getting to refinance four weeks after closing his loan because it's a bank that holds that loan. You're with a bank. They may be able to do something for you that is better than what anyone else can do and not charge you for it just to keep that loan in their portfolio since they've already originated it. But nine times out of 10, it's just marketing. So um, trust but verify. Trust that they're going to do that free loan at great terms for you, but verify. Reach out to uh, to another lender and see what's possible. There you go. Um, Josh's contact information will, you'll get it. If you use that link at the bottom, it'll get you connect you directly to Josh. So that's the easy, the easy button, if you will. Um, Josh, let's see here. There's another one I wanted to get back and to. So by the way, Vince mentioned yeah. he's in Ohio. Ohio is one of the states where Al is licensed in. So we can absolutely get you, get you taken care of there when the time comes. Well, there you go. Uh, Mike came back on and said, uh, one of my friends is going to buy in Miami, but she lives in LA. This is her first property. The officer told her her rate would be higher because you make money in LA. So is there any way around that, Josh? If you make your money in LA, say you're a model, make your money in LA, you want to buy your first home in Miami. Is there a way to make it make sense that you're living in Florida? 
you you gave a great example. You're a model. You travel the world and make money on photo shoots. You're a professional athlete. You have a family you referred, professional MLS soccer player. He's all over. He was in the US and the MLS. Now he's yeah. overseas. Does not matter where your money comes from. That has nothing to do with it. There's another sort of red herring in here um, that this is her first property. Does not matter. No one cares whether it's your first, your next, your last. It's the intended occupancy. So where you make your money doesn't matter. It matters only in the sense that is it realistic that you could occupy this as your primary residence? If you're a model who travels the globe, but this is your home base, absolutely. If you're a professional soccer player and when you come home that this is your home base and it's not going to be rented out, it's not going to be used as a second home, it's not going to go on VRBO. So those are the things they're looking at. So I think the, they just communicated poorly the reason why that interest rate is going to be higher. It's because it is not a primary residence. If it were going to be the primary residence, if the job here in Los Angeles was allowed you to work remote, we've done a ton of loans over the last two, three years for people who are moving to an area thousands of miles away from their employer. But the employer writes a letter that says, this employee is able to work remotely. Cool. We don't care where your money comes from. We care where you're going to lay your head at night. There you go. And with that, guys, we hope that you have a delightful sleep this evening with your head laying down while I am taking a sleep apnea test strap around me, got things in my nose. Earlier in the in the thing in the comments, Josh, we had a couple people say it's the greatest thing ever. And then we had somebody say, You're never going to use it. Don't buy it. So I don't know. I, I don't even know that I have it. I'm just going through the test. I'm a, I'm a test study right now, Josh. Both of the people that I know that got it, got it after the age of 70. And to them, That's it was fantastic. the most amazing thing that ever happened. Like they went from being permanently droopy eyes, falling asleep and, and no, being the grandfather as soon as you hit the chair, you're out to being uh, a vibrant alert people. So I, Dude, I maybe this is it. Day. Like maybe this is it. Like we could do another hour just on this. So I, I sleep well at night, but as soon as I lay my head down, I can fall asleep. I wake up in the morning. I feel rested. I don't feel. I don't feel like I'm dry. I do have some bags though, so maybe the bags go away. This could be. For, this could be delightful, Josh. For those of you who don't know, when Jeb says he this is a good sleeper, that is the understatement of all time. We both have the whoop strap here. We're on a team in whoop, so I get to see. I have a great week of sleep, and my whoop is saying, "Hey, you did great last week. You had ninety three percent sleep quality." And then it pops up at the end of the week. Jeb was the winner. He had ninety eight percent sleep quality. Sleep well. This this yeah. guy lays his head guy, down yeah. and is out and then wakes up at 4 a.m. like happy as all can be. So, Dude. Jeb, what I'm saying is that's telling me you do not have sleep apnea. You have a wife that just doesn't like you. No, dude. She says I stopped breathing multiple times in the night. She's videoed all it. Right. She sent it to me. So if there's a if there's better sleep out there that I don't know about, I mean, this is going to be game changer, my friends. There's 125 people listening to us talk about this, which is even more amazing. Uh, but right, with that, right here, Milo says, my husband had it at 39. Huge difference, or has it. Huge difference. People I know that, that truly have apnea and get the, the machine, they're like, oh, this is night and day difference. I can't imagine my sleep being any better. I, I, I truly say that. I'm not being facetious at all. Like, if I don't know. Back, if you come back at 100% sleep quality and just win every week, I might come choke you in your sleep. There we go. Anyway, uh, guys, happy new year. Uh, 2023 was a year, a challenging year in many uh, ways, um, personally, uh, professionally, uh, just everything and um, came with some good, some bad, but you know, we're still here, still doing it. Hope you guys find value in it. We appreciate the support. Um, happy holidays, Josh, any, any final words for this year? This is the last no. episode. 2023 last week of the year everyone is doing more fun things the fact that there were 130 140 of you throughout the hour here going through it asking really good questions i think next year is going to be a better year that's a low bar um real estate and mortgage wise rates went so high affordability was impaired so much uh, prices remained elevated so we had very low volume of sales i think we're going to have more sales. I don't know that that means any more inventory because we're going to have more buyers because we're going to have slightly better affordability. So everything's going to be a little better. Um, still going to be challenging, still going to be interesting. And hopefully you guys continue to show up here uh, every week and let us be a part of your team in helping you make good decisions and becoming the educated home buyer. 
There you go, guys. Uh, appreciate you guys. We will see you next week. It'll be the new year. Uh, actually, I don't know if we'll be here next week. I'll be in Big Bear. Oh, I was going to say, where are you going? I I, I don't have any trips planned. Where next are you going to be? Next week might not be here. We'll, we'll find out. Anyway, uh, we will see you in the new year, guys. Until next time, adios. Amigos.